Yes, so uh, earlier in the panel session, I realised I'd failed to introduce myself uh, and didn't say who I was, so uh, this is who I am. Um, it all becomes clear later. And uh, my other sort of slight miscalculation is I, I've, I and my colleagues at TU Dresden have been giving a talk on Spinnaker at every nice since I think the second nice in Albuquerque. So I thought the nice audience had heard quite a lot about Spinnaker. Um, and therefore, I was going to talk about something different. Now, of course, when you put your hands up earlier, I realize for many of you, it's your first nice workshop. So that assumption was slightly misplaced. <laughs> Fortunately, I have included um, a short description of the Spinnaker system um, at the opening of the talk. But the main focus of the talk is really to look at the, the breadth of applications um, to which this technology um, is being put. It's just a sample of the applications, but it gives you some idea of the kinds of things we're doing. Uh, I'm from the University of Manchester, which has been making programmable computers for slightly longer than IBM has. So. <laughs> <laughs> On the grounds that we made the first one. So, um, uh, so there you go. And we're still building uh, computers today. So um, what's Spinnaker? Uh, the project really started as a concept 20 years ago. Um, I can trace the origins back to some work we were doing in a different millennium, 1998. Um, and we started putting together a set of ideas that, that, that converged on this concept of saying, what, what can we do if we put a million mobile phone processors into one computer and connect them in a way that allows them to support real-time biological spiking neural network models? And the objective was very much to uh, contribute to um, our ability to, to build models of the brain to understand more about how the brain works because uh, the brain remains one of the great frontiers of science. We still fundamentally don't know the information processing principles at work inside each of our heads, which seems to me to be a very big gap in human knowledge. Um, now, if you do the basic arithmetic with a million mobile phone processors, you get nowhere near the scale of the human brain. Um, but I prefer to think of it as about uh, 10 mouse brains. Uh, the mouse brain is conveniently a 1,000 times smaller than the human brain. And, and, and now we know how our models run more realistically. We could probably just about support a network of the scale of one full mouse brain at, at sort of with the usual simplifications. Um, so this was the goal. And you might ask, why a million? Well, the answer to that is it's a big number. Um, and, and so you have to think about scalability from the outset. And, and the major innovation in Spinnaker is how we connect those processes in real time so that we can distribute models across what's inevitably physically quite a large machine. And then you might ask, why only a million? Well, Manchester may have been making computers for longer than IBM, but its resources are rather smaller. And uh, uh, we were limited by what we could feasibly build um, on an academic research budget, and we set ourselves the goal of building this machine um, on, a, on a budget of about a pound a processor, which today is the same as about a euro a processor or about a dollar a processor. Okay, the, the currencies have all converged um, for various reasons. So this is what we. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we set about doing. Um, the idea goes back 20 years. The construction started in 2005. It started with the design of a core chip. So this was des design on silicon, um, a square centimeter, which took about 40 man years of effort to put together and five years of elapsed time. Um, you know, one of my claims for microchip design is you get more PhDs to the square millimeter than in most topics, uh, which obviously matters. Um, the chip is packaged at the top of the picture here. I think this has a laser pointer. Um, I've never seen this. This is a photo taken in the packaging assembly line. Um, the lighter colored square is the Spinnaker die, and the darker rectangle on top is an industry standard uh, DRAM, which provides the bulk memory in the system. And these are co-packaged inside this attractive two square centimeter bit of black plastic um, with the logo on. And this is the basic chip that we've had since 2011, so it's getting quite old. It was quite old technology when we made it for cost reasons. It's 130 nanometer bulk CMOS. So we, we got a chip that we can then assemble, and the chip's designed so that you can tile a 2D surface with it, 
And that enables us to build these boards. And I have one with me, you know, visual aid. Um, they do exist, they're real. Um, and I will, t I think we have a demo area somewhere across the campus where uh, this is destined to go. And when, when I take it there, I'll apply power and lights will flash. <laughs> <coughs> so you can tell it's a real computer. Um, and, and that board has 48 chips. Um, I leave it as a challenge to the audience to work out why it's 48. Uh, here's a clue. It may look square, but it's actually a hexagon. Um, and if you construct hexagons in a particular way, 48 is one of the magic numbers that emerges in a sequence of uh, hexagonal structures. Uh, that's 864 arm cores. It's enough to model um, a small insect brain, Drosophila or something of that scale, um, in real time. And then we can assemble those boards. They have FPGAs at the top which effectively continue the chip-to-chip -chip communication transparently across from board to board, so we can build um, 2D toroids of almost arbitrary size. And uh, last October, we finally assembled the machine with a million cores in it. I don't think many groups have actually built computers with a million cores in. Um, we'd actually had half a million cores uh, operating as an online service within the Human Brain Project for two and a half years at that point, and expanding it to a million cores was more sort of an excuse for a party to celebrate reaching our original goal than a major technical step forward, because um, nobody had worked out how to use the half million cores. And, and uh, that remains one of the challenges, is we now have a huge, uh, I believe this is the world's largest neuromorphic uh, computing facility. Um, and the challenge is to work out how to use it. And uh, it's online. We've got a lot of remote users. It's not the only Spinnaker machine. Uh, the boards have proved fairly popular, and there are about 100 of them out um, around the globe from North America to New Zealand. Um, and some of these are this board, and some are smaller, and some are multiple boards. But uh, the big machine is the one in Manchester. So uh, the question is, what can we do with it? Uh, we built it, what does it do? And it does a range of things. Um, the first application to which it's put, obviously, is computational neuroscience, because that was the original design goal. And uh, there are a few examples of, of the sorts of things we can do there. Um, at the beginning of this year, we published a paper with our HBP colleagues at, at ULIC in Germany, who built a very detailed model of a square millimeter of cortex a cortical microcolumn model, um, which has 77,000 neurons, 285 million synapses, and so on. Um, and they run this on their supercomputer using their language, which is Nest. And we ran the equivalent model um, on Spinnaker. And so we show that we can uh, compute equivalent results. Uh, this was published in Frontiers in this paper with the details at the bottom. And, and since January, we've been using this model basically as a benchmark, because this was really challenging for us with, with the state of our tools at the time. Um, it took quite a lot of work uh, to get this to map onto the machine and to function correctly. And, but we've been using it as a benchmark since. In January, when this paper was written, running this model took about 10 hours elapsed time. Um, by improving the way we map it onto the machine, we've reduced that to seven and a half minutes. And the runtime efficiency, we're also aiming for uh, approaching two orders of magnitude um, improvements in its performance. So it's, pr it's turned out to be a challenging but very useful model uh, for improving the capabilities of the machine. Uh, another example, um, getting a bit more into the detail, looking at serotonin modulation of prefrontal cortex and, and how uh, the dorsal rafe nucleus modulates brain rhythms. You can see there's some sort of, this is not my group putting these um, biological models together. There's some real neuroscience going into this kind of modeling activity. And this particular example is a collaboration with the University of Ulster um, in Northern Ireland. And uh, at an even lower level, we're looking at uh, chemistry modulating neuron behavior. And, uh, and, and here, you know, the magic, the consciousness word appears, um, which I'm always terrified of mentioning in front of any sane audience. Um, 
Uh, but all this basically means is, is modeling the, the difference between sleep and wake states uh, in, in various brain regions. It's not consciousness in the sense of self-awareness, it's consciousness in the sense of not being asleep. Um, so it, it's the form of consciousness that applies to at least half the audience, I think. <laughs> um, so computational neuroscience is obviously the important area, but what we found um, through our collaborations in the Human Brain Project is that what really is going to make a difference in this space is theory, okay? Um, we can build lots of complicated numerical models. You know, potentially we could build a whole mouse brain model. It might work and function just like a real mouse, who knows? Um, but we might still have no idea what was going on. Um, it would just be a big complicated numerical model. It would be a bit easier to probe than a real mouse, uh, but otherwise it wouldn't move understanding forward. So theory is important. What kind of things we're doing here? Well, uh, we're working with, with groups in theory, um, such as TU Graz, Wolfgang Mass. And one example here is one of my students built um, a stochastic neural network that solves uh, constraint satisfaction problems in quite a generic way. These are problems which are supposed to be computationally hard. Um, of course, it doesn't solve them absolutely reliably, absolutely all of the time. That would be breaking somebody's rule. Um, but it you know, will solve this Sudoku problem, which is the very hardest class of Sudoku, in about 10 seconds, 90% of the time. Um, and the very same approach will solve other CSPs, such as map coloring and icing, spin systems, and so on. So you can, you can build some interesting computational structures um, based on principles of stochastic networks. Uh, I remember at a previous HBP summit, we had a speaker from D-Wave, who also have a quantum computer of a slightly different nature. And the set of problems that was good at solving was exactly the same set that you can solve with stochastic neural networks, because basically the algorithm is effectively an annealing algorithm that, that finds a, the lowest energy solution. Um, now, the D-Wave machine is a lot faster than Spinnaker at solving these problems, but it's also a lot more expensive. So, you know, you can take your choice. Um, looking at, at theories surrounding network plasticity, um, there's quite a lot of work going, as I mentioned in the panel earlier, um, about understanding how to do algorithms such as gradient descent through biologically realistic spiking neural mechanisms. Um, and HBP has, has got quite a lot of work on that. And ultimately, the goal here is, is to do this thing I mentioned earlier, which is bridge the gap between um, uh, neuroplasticity as implemented in spiking networks uh, and machine learning. And, and, and possibly through that, finding this you know, killer app for online learning or whatever it turns out to be uh, that we can do more efficiently with spiking networks. And um, one of my students has been working on this, this other topic. Um, one of the, the strengths of Spinnaker is that because the models are all software, it's very flexible. Of course, this is also a weakness because it means it's less efficient than a direct hardware implementation. Software always carries about a factor 10 overhead in efficiency terms. But it does mean you can do all sorts of things you hadn't thought of when you started. Um, and uh, here we're looking at structural plasticity, synaptic rewiring, synaptogenesis uh, as a, an unsupervised learning mechanism. And you can kind of see this happening. Um, this is uh, a network that's being exposed to variants of the MNIST digit zero. Um, so it's not a terribly exciting machine learning problem. Uh, but what you can see is, is from the connection plots, you can, you can see a sort of an image of what's being learned forming in the connections that survive the synaptogenesis algorithm um, to leave something that, 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 uh, that has a memory of what it's seen. It's learned the statistics of the inputs that have been presented without any input supervision process. Um, more on, on taking ideas from artificial networks and passing them across. Uh, this is an area which is becoming rich with um, acronyms that I can't remember all the time what they stand for, but LSTM, BPTT, that's back propagation through time. Um, SGD. 
Sorry, sorry brain failure. What? Stochastic, gradient Stochastic gradient descent, obviously, yes. I, <laughs> I, I knew that. Um, <laughs> And, and here's the training through error back propagation um, using pseudo differentials because, of course, the, the reason backprop is a problem with spiking networks is, is the spike is a horribly discontinuous function to backpropagate through. Um, and so there are mechanisms for approximating that uh, with a gradient. And uh, some of this is being deployed on neuromorphic hardware. Um, to begin to show how these algorithms can transfer across. So um, this is well, this is actually somewhere between theoretical neuroscience and computational neuroscience, looking at, at models based on basal ganglia for action selection and decision making. This is an area that's been studied for some time in, in robotics using basal ganglia as the model. And uh, in here, dopamine plays a central role. So again, we're, we're introducing neuromodulators um, in Spinnaker, although the primary role of Spinnaker's communication fabric is the delivery of spikes, asynchronous events in real time, um, we can map uh, the more continuous and more global processes such as neuromodulators onto this communication fabric, basically exploiting the fact that their timescales are significantly longer than the spiking timescale. And so uh, that's produced some interesting results. So the, the third kind of direction that we're working with, and, and this is a direction that exploits the fact that Spinnaker is a real-time platform, is in neural robotics. And uh, uh, here the idea is to build neural networks that will perform real-time control of some kind of system. Well, in fact, the first example isn't real-time. Um, this is being work done. Uh, with particularly led by Nick Kasaboff in, in Auckland, New Zealand, who's been using Spinnaker to uh, classify electrical signals uh, coming from um, the control outputs to active prostheses and recording the electrical activity of uh, participants <coughs> when they're doing particular hand movements and then doing classification of this and uh, using um, spiking networks to carry out this classification using their, their new, not sure how you pronounce that, new cube system. Um, that's more like a real-time robot looking at vestibular ocular reflex um, in iCub. Uh, there is a variant of iCub, but uh, people may not be familiar with iCub this side of the Atlantic, but iCub has been a big a sort of open source European project to build a small humanoid robot. Um, it's about the size of a six-year-old child, I think, about, about this high. And a variant of iCub has been built um, where all the sensors are event-based and, and uh, specifically tuned for spiking neural control. Um, so uh, we, we don't have anything approaching a complete robot control system, but various functions have been investigated. And this work's led by IIT, who led the development of iCub in Genoa in Italy. So, um, so that's the, the picture. Those are the three main threads of development. Um, the one of these that's, that's you know, mo most likely to lead in the direction of commercial application is the theoretical one, because that's um, where the inspiration of that is coming from. And of course, they all feed off each other in useful ways. Um, and there's a set of collaborators. Most of these are within the Human Brain Project, but, but some are outside. Um, we're open to work with anybody who's got any interesting challenge for the big machine. And uh, the Human Brain Project supports a team of, 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 of software support guys in Manchester who work with external users uh, to uh, make sure things work as well as we can make them work. Now, that's what's been going on with Spinnaker 1 uh, last year. If you were here, which most of you weren't, you'll have heard about Spinnaker 2. Uh, so it's worth just mentioning where this is going. Spinnaker 1's you know, approaching 10 years old as a piece of technology, which in this game is quite old. Um, and Spinnaker 2 is, is a second generation um, chip based on very similar principles. So it's still many core software modeling, um, event-based communication using our proprietary communication architecture which has unique capabilities. It's uh, intrinsic, multicast, so we can make the kind of 
very high level of connectivity that you find in the brain, we can make very cheaply through hardware mechanisms. Um, and so what have we learned from Spinnaker One? Well, we've been working with it, with users for seven years. Um, firstly, we do think the processor base, the flexibility that delivers is extremely valuable. Um, it's, it's not efficient, but it's flexible. And, and users have all sorts of different requirements. And a user comes along and says they have this new idea for a learning rule. Can they implement this on Spinnaker? And the answer usually is, is yes. Spinnaker's constrained. It can't do everything. Um, but within its software constraints, most things are possible. We find that in spiking networks, a number of functions come up um, a very high proportion of the time. And that justifies uh, adding accelerators. So the new, the second generation machine will have accelerators. And the most important of these is high quality random number sources. Okay, it's, it's relatively easy to get low quality random numbers in code, but getting high quality random numbers is expensive in code. It's very cheap in hardware. So um, we're putting each processing element will have a hardware um, KISS 64, if you know your random numbers um, uh, uh, generator. So there'll be a good supply. And we're finding that um, random numbers are useful not only for introducing stochasticity, but for also overcoming some of the deficiencies of low precision network computations uh, through stochastic rounding. Now, it doesn't seem that you need particularly high quality random numbers for good stochastic rounding, but that's a, a different story. Um, exponentials come up all the time, logs a bit. So we're putting accelerators on uh, for those functions. Um, Spinnaker 1 is a fixed point machine. We are using a core with single precision floats in, in Spinnaker 2. So we're um, extending the support for number types. And thirdly, in a, in a sort of completely different space, we're also building what, what's a fairly conventional machine learning accelerator onto each processing element. And it turns out that even in spiking networks, there are places where having high performance, low precision multiplier accumulate works well. Um, one area is, is the University of Waterloo's neural engineering framework, um, where we can do quite a lot of uh, performance enhancement with local multiplier accumulates. At the technology level, uh, we're still pushing very hard on energy efficiency. Uh, if you build big machines and you don't worry about energy efficiency, you inevitably end up with thermal problems. Um, and we're going to, uh, well, not the bleeding edge, but 22 FDX is, is quite advanced process technology. Um, it's also expensive with techniques such as adaptive body biasing to sort of reduce the, uh, the component variability. Um, and very fine grain power management in this system. Um, the, each processing element, and, and currently the expectation is we'll have 152 processors on the chip. So going from 18 to 152, it's just a matter of how many fit. Um, each of those processing elements will be in its own DVFS domain, so it can make local optimizations of voltage and frequency. Um, and it can do this in every time step at, po at 1 or 0.1 millisecond. Uh, when, it, when it sees the load it's going to have to compute in the next time step, it can adjust its DVFS settings dynamically to match the load. So again, that's really about engineering and energy efficiency rather than pure modeling. The goal from the outset has been to go for about 10x um, the Spinnaker 1 capability, and most of that is delivered just by using a more advanced process technology. Um, but with the accelerators, for appropriate applications, we'll basically get the functionality of this board onto a single chip. So that'll allow us to do um, you know, something approaching a small insect brain in a single chip on a watt power budget that you can easily fit into a drone. And since insect brains are quite good at controlling house flies, they ought to be quite good at controlling drones. That's a rather simple argument. but. <laughs> <coughs> We'll go with it for now. Um, right, so, and, and already we've um, had some demonstration applications. We, we're, we've just had the second prototype chip. We have a third prototype to go through before we fab the, the full big chip. 
Um, and, and quite a lot of interesting work has been done on these small prototypes. Uh, so one example, again, this is effectively a form of synaptic plasticity, um, a deep rewiring algorithm running on one of the Spinnaker 2 prototypes, um, implements one of the standard machine learning benchmarks and achieves you know, respectable accuracy on MNIST. Um, but what's astonishing here is this running entirely on chip with very limited memory. And the connectivity um, in that network is not the 100% connectivity of the standard MNIST network. It's down at about 1%. You know, so 99 out of 100 connections have been dropped in this process. And, and we can still deliver the same accuracy. And I think this kind of thing is going to have a huge impact on, on how people accelerate machine learning in the future. Because this will really trip GPUs up horribly. Um, it's also something to think about if you're putting devices into fully connected matrices. Okay, full connectivity uh, may well not be optimal. This has been published. Uh, Reward-based synaptic sampling. This is a, a sort of theoretical technique. Um, I think this one is also from TU Graz, and uh, this is one that explores various accelerators. Um, so uh, reducing energy, um, random reallocation of synapse memory running on the chip. And uh, this paper got particularly positive reviewers. I don't know how much we paid this reviewer, but uh, <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, he was clearly very happy with what he saw in the paper. We didn't pay them anything, but just in case there's any doubt. It's, uh, that, was a, that was a joke, so <laughs> you knew that. Um, and um, the, the kind of adaptive robot arm control um, that we're seeing um, becoming of increasing interest to roboticists who want to build robots that can work in environments with humans rather than having to be fully caged off to protect the humans. Um, and this, uh, this is something that, that is using the Waterloo Neural Engineering Framework. The NEF works in a rather different way to most of our other spiking networks. Um, and this does mean that it, uh, it benefits uh, very much from the multiply accumulate um, accelerator. And, and we, we get 10x from the process. We get another 10x from multiply accumulate on these applications. So um, I think I'll wrap up. We've been doing this for a long time. It seems like a large chunk of my life has gone into uh, leading this project in Manchester. Um, but we've had hardware out, and it's been working. And we've, you know, we've solved some quite hard problems. How, you know, how do you make a million-core computer work reliably? Right, is is a non-trivial question. If you've never tried it, um, it takes a bit of work. And uh, this is now running. It's online. It's 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 a fully available service through the Human Brain Project, and HBP has also supported the development of the second-generation machine and. Uh, this is aiming for you know, broadly 10x improvement. Um, tape out of the full chip, scheduled for April next year. And we have various prototype chips, both on silicon and in FPGA form, uh, that people are working with now. I mean, available is probably, well, it will be non-trivial to actually do anything with this unless you're directly involved in its development. So. Um, that's just a sort of flavor of the kind of things that the, the, the machine is doing. Of course, you know, we at Manchester are just providing the service and supporting the users. Most of the interesting stuff you see here has been done by people outside, but with the machine. So um, that was the message I wanted to convey. So thank you very much. So just a couple of questions. Let me go ahead and start here. Steve, um, you kind of, I think you mentioned that no one, or I don't know, maybe someone has, or has someone used the full million cores in an application yet? And I think you said they haven't, and if not, what is kind of the challenge? Is it just that it's, no one has an application that's at that scale yet, or? So the, the only applications that have used the full scale of the machine have been applications that we've developed for machine debug purposes primarily. So you know, we, 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 we have some applications which will run all million cores up. 
Um, and, and that's mainly to do things like testing the cooling, right? <laughs> you know, does the machine melt? Um, um, uh, so they don't do anything useful as applications apart from test the machine. Um, in terms of, of useful applications, um, uh, then, then the cortical micro column um, used about six boards out of six out of twelve hundred, so it was five percent of the machine, and that's one of the bigger ones. And it shouldn't have used six boards, and it will use less than one board when we've reworked the software. Um, but Ulich is, is scaling that model up, so it's a single cortical micro column. It's relatively easy now to scale that up to four by four or ten by ten, and, and we are planning to build a ten by ten, so a hundred times. Um, uh, 100 square millimeters of cortex, and, and that will begin to occupy, you know, a whole rack cabinet, you know, order 10% order of the machine. Um, so there are some bigger networks coming, but I think the real reason that people aren't using this, well, there are, there are, there are two reasons. The, the sort of the, the historic one is, is, is people just aren't used to being able to build networks this big, and building a big biological network is non-trivial in itself. I mean, Building the cortical microcolumn involved vast amounts of trawling through published neuroscience data to get the right numbers and the right number of connections and the right neuron dynamics for each different neuron type in the cortical microcolumn. There are many different types; they're not all the same. Um, and, and so, building uh, building the next level of model is, is a huge amount of work to get the data together. The second reason, of course, is if somebody turned up tomorrow with a whole mouse brain model and said, can we run this on Spinnaker, it would almost certainly break our software. Um, because until you test the software with big models, um, you don't know where the weaknesses are. And, and every significant scale up of model has required we rework some algorithms to make them more efficient to get the runtime down to something sensible. Um, Spinnaker is an incredibly soft machine. Okay? Almost everything can be reprogrammed. How you allocate keys to neural events, where you map neurons onto processes, how you do the routing, it's all soft. And, and so the, the space you have to search to find a, not an optimal solution, but one that works in a reasonable time is, is inconceivably vast. Um, so all the algorithms have to basically be heuristic. A um, couple of details, mostly. Um, you mentioned these high-quality random numbers. I mean, what do you mean by high-quality, and why exactly do you need them? <laughs> because so um, what do I mean by high-quality? What I mean by high-quality is what the people who care about random numbers mean by high-quality. So there's a set of standard tests for a random number generator. Uh, sure, but I mean, those tests are typically for cryptography applications, yes. and I don't see why would a brain-based application care about you know, prime numbers and factorization and so on. Well, if, you, if, you're, if your random number generators are not high quality, then you get random number sequences with correlations that you don't want, OK? And um, you know, one example is there's a very simple ARM random number generator, which generates a 32-bit random number from a 33-bit LFSR in five clock cycles. It's very efficient, very fast. Mm -hmm. Um, but these are not high quality. The sequence length is 2 to the 33 minus 1, um, which sounds like quite a long sequence. But now have a million processors all using that, right? and suddenly correlations become much more likely. Um, and if there's one thing that neural nets are good at, it's spotting correlations you didn't want them to spot. <laughs> OK. Um, so, so for that kind of purpose, um, High quality, in other words, random numbers with, with sequence lengths of 2 to the 128 kind of scale rather than 2 to the 32 um, are highly desirable. And they're not very difficult to make in hardware. <coughs> okay, there, are, there, there are lots of well-developed, and we're not inventing new algorithms. We're just picking algorithms of the quality. The other reason we want high quality is because one of the guys who looks after this is very fussy about these things. So. Uh, you know, Mike Michael Hopkins is very, very keen on random number generators and numerical precision and other stuff. Which again, again, you know, we've had discussions about what precision do you need in this machine, and and you know, my my initial view was, well, the brain's noisy, approximate. You know, does it matter? But then you come across users, right? And users run their networks on their high-performance computers in double precision float, and they expect the same answer. 
right? So if you want to keep users happy, you've got to deliver the numerical precision they want. Whether, whether or not it's justified is, is kind of not your problem anymore. It's their problem. Your problem is to deliver it. So, so that's why we've, we've, you know, we've, we're just about to produce a, a paper for a Royal Society discussion meeting on, on how to get very high precision with limited numerical resources. Now, if you don't want high precision, this is irrelevant. Um, but it turns out it's doable, and, and stochastic rounding is a key component of doing it. Probably, my name is Thanks, Steve, again, and we'll catch you in the